okay, we're ready to go. Thanks so much for making time to see me. I, I, I'm a big admirer. Oh, thank you. So, uh, thanks for the kind words, Anthony. Um, so I, I understand that your story is a, a little bit different from some people in our community. Uh, I is think it that'd be fair to say. <laughs> is it okay if I call you Anthony? Yeah, that would be preferable. Thank you. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got to where you are? Sure. So should I lead with the headline, uh, you know, having murdered somebody and got to prison, or should I give a little bit of backstory to explain who I am before I, before I completely shatter that? Um, what your choice? I, I think you've led with the headline at this point. Fair I think enough. You've already shared Fair it. enough. Well, I mean, it's on the title of the, the stream, so it's not a surprise. I think. So I'm 41 years old now. Um, uh -huh. American, obviously. Um, grew up very poor. Um, in a really abusive home, no father, uh, mom was a drug addict pretty bad when I was young. She sold me and my brother one time to the drug dealers. Well, pawned us, I guess would be a better way to say it. Uh, and then my grandma ended up having to come and pay her debt to get us to bond us out of the drug dealers. I only heard that story later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thankfully I have no memory of that. So that that's just, uh, give you a little bit of context. I never knew that version of my mom, thankfully. Um, when I was two or three years old, I got ran over. Uh, my mom ran me over with a with a Chevy Blazer, which is a one ton truck, I think, um, on accident. Um, I remember remembering parts of it, but I have no memory of it. Um, I know she was in a rage with her boyfriend and uh, was going to leave in, in the truck. And uh, I evidently tried to stop her and she didn't notice and she ran me over. So then I spent the next, mm, uh, this is pretty emotional. Just bear with me. This is a hard shit to talk about. I've never talked to anybody about this actually. Um, I spent the next several years in hospitals and wheelchairs and crutches trying to walk and uh, never playing never getting to play or anything because, you know, full length cast on both legs. So it was tough. And uh, thankfully, I can walk. That, that's something, you know. And uh, to this day, actually, finally, as I get older, the pain gets worse. Just every day, it gets worse in my legs. Um, the gift that keeps on giving, you know. So anyways, that was my childhood. And, uh, so then I finally got, I finally got through that and, uh, started going to school and everything. Never made any friends. Everybody hated me. Uh, never could figure out why. Like we moved a lot, a lot. And, uh, I was the common denominator in every scenario where I had no friends. Uh, I was always bullied and picked on. And I'm big. I was big as a kid. I was the biggest in my class. So you would think, well, how do you get bullied? It, it, I wonder, is it because I was a pussy? And I don't think it is. I don't think that's what it was. I think I just wanted to be liked. And I'm very cerebral. I'm not usually this emotional. I'm very cerebral. And so when people would come and at attack me, it was like, I wasn't getting mad. I was just like, why? Like, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to know why. I wanted to talk about it and understand the situation, and I never could. And so probably an easy prey type of thing, you know? And plus, I was big, so it looks good. You're, you're, you're bullying the big guy, you know? And so that, 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 that I never had any friends, really. Or I, I would always have, like, maybe one outcast, fellow outcast who was a friend. Um, and that never lasted long. I don't know why. I, I drive all my friends away. And again, I know I'm the common denominator in all of these things. So I would like to know what that is. And I know you wouldn't have that insight in a two hour interview, but um, that's something I've been trying to to, I, to figure out. Like, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I may not have that insight, but you may have that insight. I may. And that's what I'm hoping. You're very yeah. good at leading questions. You're very, very good at that. That's your strength. And I've never seen a therapist before or anything like that, but if they're all like you and that's the method they use, I mean, that's phenomenal. You, you know, you help the person find the answer within. And I think that's critical. You don't preach to them from without. And I think that, that that's really important. So first of all, Anthony, thank Good. you so much for sharing. I mean, it sounds like um, 
That's a lot, bro. Yeah, I was kind of a dump right there. Um, no, I mean, I, I wasn't so much thinking about the dump, just as, you know, it's one thing to dump that, but to have all of that to dump, <laughs> you know, that that's sort of more of what I mean. It's like, wow, like, can you catch a break in any dimension? I feel I feel that much of the time, to be honest with you. Um, I'm constantly... And I see a lot of your, your your people talk about this, and it resonates with me. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. When something good's happening, all right, now what? Now what's the, you know, where's the lightning? It's got to be coming. It's got to be coming. If, you know, if my past history is any is anything to go by, you know, the bad the bad is coming right away. Okay. Um, Anyway, I, I sort of jumped in for a second, but I think you were sharing a little bit about, so it seems like you were getting bullied a lot, had trouble making friends. You kind of called yourself the common denominator because you're moving around and this keeps happening, right? right? New right. set of people, new set of kids, same patterns. You know, yes, exactly. And so those were my school years. Um, just to give a little insight into myself, um, I coasted through school with A's and B's. And when I say coasted, I mean basically did no work. Uh, I would show up, listen to the lectures, take the take the test, and that's it. Like I, I absorb things quite easily. Except mathematics, I struggle with that greatly. But otherwise, I in in and I've got it right one time. And so that's that's a blessing. I have that going for me, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so I really never had to put in effort at school, and that's a trend that continues to this day. I'm a full time student in college. And while I would really like to be applying myself, I don't. I, I wait till the very last minute. I breeze through it, and then I get straight A's. So there's like no incentive to break that pattern. And that's kind of a drag because at some point, that's going to blow up in my face. I'm just waiting on that to happen. And I <clears throat> I would like to find the... There's the other shoe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good call. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so those are my school years. We were pretty poor. Like I said, mom made me start working a full-time job when I was, I think 12. I had to lie about my age to get a job. So I had to work full-time and go to school and I had to pay rent and to my mom and buy my own clothes and all that kind of stuff. Um, she had sent my brother away. She gave my brother the state when a couple of years prior to that. So I was the only remaining kid. Um, she kicked me out of the house. Well, first she had me put in jail. She li she lied about me and had me put in jail when I was 14, I believe, 15. Yeah, I was 15. Um, she was a very volatile person. And by that time, I was big enough. She couldn't beat me anymore. Uh, and just to give you an instance, so it wasn't, it wasn't just beatings. My mom was very physically abusive. Um, I was 10, 11. You first start to get your adult teeth. And uh, I didn't wear a shirt she picked out for me one day. And she took my head and she slammed it into the side of the bathtub repeatedly. And she broke that tooth, which is still broken to this day. And she knocked out that tooth and she broke that tooth. And then mom told me, you better not tell anybody. You better tell them you fell off the monkey bars or something. Because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. And nobody's going to care. I'm allowed to. I'm your mom. I'm 10. I'm however old I was. And, and so absolutely, I believe that. That's gospel truth. And so then even if they do, and even, and she didn't say it in this tone, I'm trying to, trying to make light of it because it's very painful for me. And that's how I diffuse tension. Um, she said, <clears throat> and even if they did care, all they would do is put you in a foster home and you'd get molested. So, you know, take your choice. And so, of course, I never said anything to she didn't have to say that, by the way. That was my mom. I loved her to death. I wasn't going to tell on her. You know I mean, I didn't think I was being abused. It was only later I came to that realization. I thought she was being a mom. So it was very volatile, but eventually I got big enough to where she couldn't manhandle me like that. And uh, I remember, so keep in mind at this time, I'm going to school to high school full time. Of course, it's high school. Um, and I'm working full time. And so I'm getting like five hours of sleep a night. Um, I mind. It, it was, you know, that's life. You got to learn how to work eventually. You know what I mean? So that's, it is what it is. Um, what I did mind is that every day she would come home from work 
and it's this coworker was such a piece of shit. This coworker had done that. She got in a fight with this coworker for that reason. Uh, you know, she's dead now. You know, bless her soul, she's dead. But she was never happy unless she was in conflict. I don't know if you've ever known anybody like that, but that's unless there was some kind of conflict, she wasn't happy. And so uh, <clears throat> I fucked up this day. She came home and she, you know, this coworker, blah blah blah, and and. and you know, I'm working too. I'm going to school. I'm 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 having hell at school. No, you know, it's bullying only gets worse as you get older, believe it or not, in school. Um, more violent. And now I wasn't the biggest, so you know. And uh I, I never said shit. I just went about my life. I didn't cry about it, I didn't complain to her about it, I just did my business. But every day I gotta listen to her negativity and uh so she tells me, she tells me all this and I fucked up. I said, wow, you just sound like you have a hard time getting along with anybody at work. Oh man, she freaked out. She pulled a knife out on me. She, she just, she just went fucking ape shit. So nothing really came of that except that she went to her room and I went to bed. We went to our corners. We went back to our corners. And then the next morning I woke up and I was being arrested by the police and she told him I pulled a knife on her and threatened her life. And this and that and the other thing. Actually, that was it. That was what she told them was that I pulled a knife on her and threatened her life. And she's my mom. So they took my, they took her word for it. No questions asked. And an interesting fact, when you're a juvenile, the only person who can get you out of juvenile hall is your legal guardian, which in my case was my mom who had put me in there. So she had me hostage in there and I had to agree to whatever she wanted me to agree to, to get out. And, uh, I dreamed of going to college. That was my escape. That was my lifelong dream was that, uh, that I was going to go to college, but no money, none, no money. So scholarship was what I was hoping for, but now I had a criminal record. And so I went that dream. I thought I, I didn't know. I thought, and so I dropped out of school after that is what's the point. There's no end game anymore, you know, uh, and my mom kicked me out of the house. I guess I dropped out cause she kicked me out of the house. Uh, and so I went to live with my uncle and he, he was, uh, he actually turned out to be a violent drunk. And so then I went to live home. I went to go live on the streets and I, I wandered around the country. I hitchhiked across the country for a while. Best time of my life, in a way, that freedom, you know what I mean? Can Tuckers are amazing people. Go ahead. I was just saying, when you said, you know what I mean, and I was about to say, no, no, I don't. Can you help me understand? Like maybe I can, yeah, yeah. It's, well, number one, I'm not living under constant fear anymore of my mom, my uncle, whoever, you know. Believe it or not, living on a highway, is, it was less emotionally traumatizing. So, um, plus you, I, I never had a bad experience. And I'm a big guy. And I was a big guy at that point. I'm over six feet tall. And I'm big. You know, I, I'm a big guy. So, it would not be the same, I think, for a woman hitchhiking across the country. But for a man, I, I never had a negative experience. You know, truck drivers would give me a ride. They would shoot the shit with me. They would give me a little cash to help me on my way. And I just met really good people. I just met a lot of really good people across country. And uh, so to cut to the chase, I ended up at one point. Oh, so my brother was 18 by this point. He had been released by the state. He'd been let, she had given him away to the state. He was now living on his own. So I went to go stay with him. My brother always hated me, I think. I think he always hated me. Uh, he was, he, he, I, I can't even give you, I don't even want to go into that too deeply because it, it doesn't really matter. He hated me, but I looked up to him. He was the only male in the house, even though he was only a couple of old, uh, years older to, than I, he was like a father figure, I suppose, in my mind. But he always hated me and rejected me and, and uh, never wanted to be around. I was the annoying little brother, you know, I was the tag along little brother who had zero social skills of his own, go out and make friends. Um, 
as you know, and other people are learning those social. I've I've only read this in recent months when I've been wondering what the fuck's up with me. Um, I didn't get that socialization at the crucial years, you know. And so, I, you know, there's no making up for lost time. I think with that. So that's something I've gone through my whole life. Complete lack of social skills. Um, and uh, so I went to stay with my brother temporarily. He said I could I could stay with him for a couple of months. And uh, so I went to stay with him. And I thought, well, that'd be cool. And it was. And it was in a way, but he lived in a place. He lived, excuse me. Uh-huh. He lived in a place. You can't even call where he lived a town. It was it was nothing. It was a nowheresville. There was no jobs. There was no businesses. There was no nothing. There was there was it was nothing. Um, he just happened to live there, and so there was nothing for me to do. He was at work all day. There was nowhere for me to get a job. There was nothing for me to do. So I was just there bored. And then he would go hang out with his friends, and I I he didn't want me coming along, and so. I guess I felt rejected by that. All right. I definitely felt rejected by that, but I only realized that now. I didn't realize that at the time. Um, funny how hindsight is so useful, but foresight would be even better. Um, so he had a good friend. So th- they were like, they were in a gang, right? But the thing is, this town, like it had two rival gangs, but there was no town. There was nothing to fight over. So I don't understand, right? And I, to this day, I still don't. So they were in this gang, and um, one night, they, uh, my brother was out with his friends, and then the friends came back, and my brother wasn't there. And so I asked my brother's friend. I said, "Well, where's my brother?" And he said, um, "Oh, well, we got jumped by by these rival gang members, and they pulled a gun, and so I ran away, and your brother's still there." And so I said, what the, what, what? So we went and got a guy, I went and got my gun and we were going to go get my brother and try to rescue him. And then he just happened to pull up at that time. Well, that, that, that is why I tell people I killed that guy. Okay. That scenario. The fact that he let my brother have a gun pulled on him and abandoned him. And that's true. That is, that is partially true. That is publicly true. And that, that is true within me as well, but that's not the whole story. I don't think. I think a lot of it was jealousy, the relationship he had with my brother that I didn't, right? The fact that my brother liked him more than me, and clearly, obviously, no no bones about it, right? And um, so I think it was that sort of jealousy that caused me to do that. And I've only come to that realization later that perhaps if it were not for that, perhaps if it were not for that, that jealousy, I would not have let that be a reason to shoot him. So I just want to make a couple things clear, Anthony. So first of all, sure. um, you know, are, I want to make sure. I don't know how we're going to make sure of this, but um, I, I understand that you spent some time in prison. But like, is there anything yes. that you could be saying right now that could get you in trouble? No, I've been convicted of it. I, I was guilty. Of it. Okay. I've already done my prison sentence. Okay. So I, I just want to make, because I'm not a lawyer. It doesn't sound like you're a lawyer. Um, no. I, I, you know, the last thing that I would want is anything negative to happen to you by. No, you know, no, this of, is a ca- this was okay. a case that long, long since been adjudicated. I've, I've fulfilled my sentence for it. Uh, it's, it's and so, so it sounds like the dude that abandoned your brother, you ended up killing. Yes. I shot him. Like at that time or like later, later on. Later on, so that 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 whole night. So when my brother showed up, the guy was like, "Oh, you're one of us now. You proved your loyalty. You're 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 part of the gang now by getting jumped." I guess I don't know. My brother was all beat up, so they shaved his head. Uh, I guess this was a Sereno ritual or whatever. I don't I don't know anything about it. I I'm speaking it out of ignorance, so I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there was a big party that night, and um. Everybody left slowly but surely. Everybody trickled out. And Santiago is my victim's name. I want to call him by name because he deserves that respect. What I did was fucked up. And Santiago was the last, was still there. In fact, they stayed overnight. Now, Santiago was 24. 
and his girlfriend was 14. And uh, yeah, that, that was kind of creepy. And I, But they were there that night and he was sleeping on the couch and she was sleeping on the floor and my brother was in bed and they went to sleep. And so then I went to my room and I went to sleep. Well, the next morning, my brother went to work. This was 6 a.m. roughly. Um, and so I was up and they were still asleep. And so <clears throat> I woke the guy up and I said, hey, he said, what's up? I said, you know, you're a real pussy, right? He said, what's that? I said, you're a real pussy. He said, why is that? I said, you almost got my brother killed. And he had this little 18 inch aluminum crowbar and he picked it up and he said, what? Do you want to have a problem or what? And he didn't know I had a pistol right there in my lap. And so I said, yes, I do. And I shot him in the face and he died later at the hospital. And his girlfriend woke up and she said, what, what, what's happening to nothing? I don't know. What do you mean? And, uh, anyways, that, that's, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it. Cause that's just gossip and there's no point. That's what came of it. Uh, the police came, I got arrested. Uh, I got second degree murder. At this, I was 16 years old. I got charges and I got charges in adult. I got 20 years in adult prison. Uh, the maximum possible sentence. I was terrified going into prison because, you know, people know what prison's like. Or they think they do, I, I guess I would say. And, you know, school bullying's bad, but prison, prison, there's nowhere to go. There's no home to go to. You're there. Mm. And uh, I knew that, I knew that um, if you get victimized once, it'll never stop in there. It, it will never stop. And so, truthfully, at 16, a 20 felt like a life sentence. I see people saying, like, 20 years is not that bad and things like that. But trust me, it's in prison, it's not 20 years. It's, it's 20 lifetimes. Um, so I got 20 years, but it felt like a life sentence to me. So all my give a fucks were gone. And I didn't want to be a victim. I knew that much going in. I didn't want to be a victim. If nothing else, I knew that. And so I kind of just went crazy in there. Like I didn't care if somebody talked, if somebody talked, talked slick, it was going down. That was the bell immediately. You know what I mean? And I stabbed people and I got new, I got new prison sentences in there. I got increased sentences in there for stabbing people. And long story short, um, prison is about what you expect. Maybe it's real boring. I don't really have too much, too much to go into about that. I, I don't feel like it gave me anything positive at all. I feel like it was only a negative experience. I deserved, I had coming. I deserved it. I have zero regrets about going to prison. I deserved every bit of it. So, so I'm not here feeling sorry for myself about that. Everything else. Yeah, that, no, I, I deserved that 100% longer. I feel, but, there's a lot of self-loathing I feel about that. And what uh what do you mean by about killing that about killing Santiago? And so I've been out. Are you able to hear me okay? Because your screen just cut out. Yeah, sorry, I'm switching servers again. It kind of lagged out for a second. I can hear you Good. now. And so <clears throat> and so uh I've been out. Five or six years, I had to start from square zero. All my family cut me off when I went to prison. Um, so I have no fam. I had, I still have no family. My mom tried to make, my mom tried to make, um, tried to make a connection when I got out, only when I got out. When I went to prison, when I went, when I got arrested, she told me she hoped I got the death penalty. Um, that was a monster. It's like, well, thank you, creator, Dr. Frankenstein. I appreciate that assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't talk for 20 years. And I got out and she wanted to reconnect. And um, I tried. I couldn't forgive her. I just couldn't forgive her. And <clears throat> she later died. She had drank herself to death over the years. Um, and, um, uh, I did tell her though, 
I remembered the good things she did for us, you know, not just the bad, but the good. The only thing I ever wanted her to acknowledge was that she was young, she didn't know how to parent, and she did a shitty job. No, uh-uh. We were bad kids. That's all there was to it. We were bad kids. Nobody ever had bad kids. Like what she did. Nobody. You're the worst thing that ever happened. How do you feel about not being able to forgive her? All I wanted was an acknowledgement. I guess I've forgiven her. I guess I've forgiven her internally, but not 100%, I don't think. Because without that acknowledgement that she, that she fucked up, I just can't get past it. Or, yeah, I guess I can forgive. I just can't get over it. And uh, go ahead. I see, you're, I see you're poised on the verge of... Yeah. <laughs> Looks like you know my tells well, Anthony. Yeah, because I, I was just going to kind of ask, like you say, you can't forgive her, but like, you know, whose fault is that? Fine. I mean, I can only, I can only control my emotions myself. I mean, so that, that that's where I know it's kind of weird, but like, I'm not so sure, right? So I, I would say, and I, I mean, Anthony, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting, and if you want to keep going, go for it. But no, no, just please. to kind of jump in for a second, so I think like something weird has happened with forgiveness, where we've placed the burden of responsibility on like the person who does the forgiving, the victim, the victim, right? Right. Which is sort of weird. Like, I think it's just interesting because I, I think that forgiveness is like yours to give or not to give. And it's entirely your choice. You know, to, is forgiveness to, earned? I think so. It's kind of, isn't that what they say that you have to earn somebody's forgiveness? And so, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I get where you're, I pick up what you're putting down there. Yeah. Right. So, so it's in, in this, I, yeah. I'm noticing that there's like themes, which, you know, you're sharing a lot with me. Like I said, I don't know that I can figure things out in two hours, but you may be able to. Um, and, and just kind of noticing that, like, you know, what's the common denominator, who's to blame, you know, this idea that if I want to be a good person, like I should forgive, right? Cause we sort of associate that and we say like, good people are the ones that are forgive. And if I don't forgive, what that also means is that like, then I'm a bad person and I haven't been, you know, good enough. My heart is not big enough to where I can forgive my mom. Who's never acknowledged any of the crap that she's done to you. And and there's a part of me that says like that's fine, right? It, it, you don't you don't have to actually forgive her. Like you don't need to forgive and you don't need to forget. I think making peace with it is one thing, but I think that you can make peace with it without forgiving. You can say that I will never forgive this person for what they did. Um, you know that can never be repaired, and I got the short end of the stick in that relationship, and I will be disappointed and hate them as well as love them. And that can be like a confusing piece to come to, but I don't think you need to forgive her, you know, especially well, she if she never asked for it. Right. Well, cause she didn't feel like she needed to forget. There was, she had done nothing wrong in her eyes. Yeah. In fact, she, she, and I, I want to emphasize here that things I described my mom did to me. I was the favorite. My brother was the, she made it very obvious that he was the least favorite. He got it so much worse than I did. And he kind of lucked out in that she turned him over to the state because he ended up at this boy's ranch that he loved. And, and just so he kind of lucked out in a way, but also with a horrible mom, right? Yeah. And so when I confronted her years later after prison, I said, Mom, why did you do these things to me? I was imagining things, she said. And I said, Mom. Oh, Am I imagining broken? Am I imagining those broken teeth? I said, you knock, you slammed my face against the bathtub and you knocked my, oh, and she broke my, I forgot to mention that my jaw got broken in that as well. So I had to have my jaw wired shut after that as well. And I said, so until you broke my jaw and knocked out three of my teeth. Am I imagining that? She said, I caught you smoking. So it wasn't that she didn't remember what she had at first alleged. It was that she thought she had caught me smoking, which I guess if that's good enough to abuse your child, but that wasn't even the cause. It was the shirt. So to get over that is very difficult because like it, without the acknowledgement or the asking of the forgiveness or even the realizing that she needs forgiveness, it's, it, it's very difficult for me to overcome that. So I've been out now six years. 
starting from square zero, like I said, I, I, I started out with call center jobs and I, I've just been pulling myself up by the bootstraps, as they say. Um, that's wow. rough. Yeah, that's been rough because the felony is also a gift that keeps on giving. A little known fact, you can't rent you can't rent a place with a felony on your record. Uh, you can't really get most jobs. You, but yet you also are supposed to work and, and live somewhere and live lawfully. So I don't understand how that conundrum works for a lot of people. But thankfully, through sheer dumb luck, I guess, I've managed to scrape by so far and keep a roof over my head and a job. And um, then the coronavirus thing happened. And uh, I've been out of work for quite a while now, a year and a half. And uh, I think idleness has been causing it. I know it has. I, I, I went through, I'm going to assume it was a depression this last year, months long, like verge of suicide. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, trying to figure out a reason to live. Trying to figure out a reason to go to tomorrow and coming up empty and too cowardly to kill myself. And um, I never experienced, believe it or not, 20 years in prison, never experienced depression, never experienced anything like that. Um, it was crippling. It was horrible. I think it was the idleness. And uh, so... I've just been coasting along, trying to figure out what what the fuck am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do? I'm sorry, I don't know if you. I, I'm going to try to stop cussing because I don't know what how your format is on that. <laughs> um, but trying to figure out what I'm going to do with myself, and and you know, and I don't know. And nothing, nothing is appealing. Nothing is appealing. Um, I don't leave my house. I'm pretty much a shut in at this point. So eventually, I just said, you know what, you got to land on something. And so I'm going to college full time for computer programming because like I said, I'm pretty intelligent. I can pick things up pretty easily. And that looks like something where even with a felony, you can at least make a reasonable living. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And it's, it's going fine. It's, it's all right. Um, I, I'm 4.0 GPA. I'm in my sophomore year. I've been 4.0 every semester, but Again, I don't, I don't apply myself. I'm unable to apply myself to this. It's like, I can do the bare minimum to coast. Well, okay. If I got anything less than an A, I would actually apply myself. I have to be honest. I'm pretty egotistical about my grades, but the fact that I'm able to coast along and just get that, I feel like sort of is handicapping me in a way um, for the future or maybe not. I, I, I'm kind of torn between that or are my motors going to kick in when they need to kick in. And right now I can idle and so I'm just idling, you know, and I, I, I don't know the answer. To that. That's some things I'm hoping you can help me figure out. Am I lazy? Am I unmotivated? Uh, I don't know. I'm very lazy. I'll tell you that right now. Tell me about that. I would love to tell you about that because that's something I would like to talk about. Um, Small things that require no intelligence or no thought or no no chal present no challenge. Uh, it, I till the till the dishes are piled up in the sink and I'm out of clean clothes, those things aren't getting done. Until the floors look disgusting, they're not getting swept and mopped. Till the table is covered in dust, I'm not going to dust it. I hate that kind of thing. I, I I don't hate it. I and the interesting thing is, I don't hate it when I'm doing it. I dread it when I'm planning it. But when I'm doing it, it's sort of a Zen thing you get into where you just turn your brain off and you go. And yet I dread, I, I dread it, right? So I don't know. And, but on the other hand, if a pro if something comes up and it seems really, really challenging and difficult and, oh, God, it's going to be brutal, let's go. I'm on it. And I will work maniacally until in done. And so, so is that a bit? I would say that would be a benefit if I would feel the fill that other time with something productive, but I don't. I fill it with watching YouTube and, and playing video games and just time wasting, Reddit and, and just time wasting. Do you do you have fun playing video games and watching YouTube? Watching YouTube, no. I feel like I'm actually addicted to uh YouTube, to be honest with you. I I it's it's addictive, man. It pulls you in. You go in to watch one thing 
And then the next thing you know, you're just blindly clicking videos that sound mildly interesting, trying to find something, that, a video that you can actually make it through to the end. That's in, and it's like a vicious cycle. And that will keep me up till three in the morning sometimes when I have to be in bed at 10. Um, that's something I struggle with a lot. My video game, it's a love-hate relationship. I play World of Tanks. I'm terrible at it, but <laughs> what are you going to do? One of us. If right. you say that right. a, a video game do? is a, is a love-hate relationship, that means you're one of us. Oh. Right, absolutely. If you don't hate, at least half hate your video game, you're not doing it right. Hmm. So, Anthony, what can I help you with? Well... I guess just like how do how do I? Okay, another. Th I guess I'm not done. Okay. Um, I, I have not been with a woman since I've been out. I've not really seen any that I've been attracted to, to be honest with you, that aren't mm -hmm. in a relationship or whatever the case may be. But also, I just don't seem to feel a sex drive that other people feel like ever. Well, I mean, I I masturbate. I tap every month or so, once a month or so, but that's quite low. I know I, I see the urges that other people have, and I've never really felt those urges. I've never really felt very, very, uh, like I said, I'm very cerebral. I, I've never felt very, very sexually, uh, driven. And, uh, oh, but I get a lot of people ask me, when are you going to hook up with a woman, man? And I would like to, I'm not saying I wouldn't like to, I'd very much like to, but I just don't have that impulse to go out and get it. I'm waiting on her to knock on my door, I suppose. You mentioned that there's damage to your legs and you feel pain. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I um, limp pretty bad. How are you? I know it's kind of like a weird question. Do you know if you have like any atrophy of the, of the quadriceps muscles? So like, I don't have a calf muscle at all. I don't uh -huh. know. Let me see if you can see what we're working with here. I don't know. May, I don't know what the quadriceps is, so I don't know. Thighs. Are your thighs atrophied? So no, but my calf muscle is. Okay. Um. And my feet are deformed. I have horrible sciatica, uh, back pain. Um, just like, uh, and it's getting worse. Like I've been to doctors and they pretty much tell me that I'm imagining things or that there's nothing they can do about it basically is what it boils down to. Um, but then they don't look either. They don't, they, they, they never touch you. They won't actually touch your back. And I don't know if that's how you examine a back, but I would think that touching the back as a professional would be a good place to start. They won't even lay a finger on you. They won't even touch you. They ask you questions. They send you in for an MRI that's about that big. You get that much of them to look out of your back. Oh, no, we don't see anything. Sorry. Try these exercises. Try these stretches. Those don't work. Oh, oh then we're out of ideas. And so that's a they very even, frustrating thing. They don't even thing. do it's like a straight leg test where they lift up your heel. Do they? Does I don't anyone think ever... so. No, I don't. Th I think maybe a physical therapist did. I'm a fucking psychiatrist. Anyway. I know you, that's, you're supposed to do that. <laughs> okay. So I would like to learn. Okay. Why am I so lonely and alone? Can that be changed? And if not, how do I make peace with that? And um, how do I find a purpose in life? Like I don't like computer programming is just for it's just something to do. I feel no passion for it whatsoever. It's just, it's interesting. I'll give it that. It's interesting and it's challenging, but it's not something I'm like, ah, oh, this is something I'm really driven to do. And and I used to feel that way about things. And I, I still do about some things, you know, politics, but I probably shouldn't, honestly. I, I got involved in prison politics pretty heavily as a white person. And I'm a pretty virulent anti-Semite, um, and I feel very strongly about that. I'm not a racist, but I'm very anti-Semitic, um, and so that's not something that's really socially acceptable in 2021, and uh, it is what it is. I don't care. I believe what I believe, and I've, I've, I know what I know, and so it, it is what it is. It's not up for debate or negotiation, um, but... I want to know what to do with my life. I want to know how do I find passion about something, anything. I used to believe in, in religion. Well, that was the first thing to go, you know, although interestingly, the more I study quantum physics in the beginning of the universe, the more that just sounds like God. 
So I don't know. The, maybe the more I learn, the more I, the the more religious I become. Interestingly, um, so I guess I'm just more questioning on a religious aspect. But that really doesn't ha- that that institution doesn't have the the faith for me it once had. The government has lost all credibility with me long since. Probably just as I got older. Um, maybe that's natural. You see, you know how the sausage is being made, and that's an ugly process in general. Um, and so politics has lost all of its, that institution has lost all of its credibility for me. The media has lost. So like, what do I believe in? I guess that's what I'm, what am I to believe in? Maybe that's what I'm trying to get to. What am I to believe in? Do you feel lonely? Yes. And no, I love <laughs> solitude, but at the same time, I feel so lonely. Sometimes I see being with other people looks like fun from the outside being with other people is a trying chore for me tell me about that it's nothing not bad it just it feels tiring i i I, at the end of it i want the whole time i want to go home i don't say that but i'm just like i'm just like i'd rather be home doing my thing and when i'm out what 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 is it that's trying about being with other people what drains you Hey, trying to be interest a facade, perhaps putting on a facade, because um, yep. in reality, so I displayed a little bit of personality to you. You know, I can make a little joke now and then, but in reality, everybody that is a facade. If it were just me being me, I'm probably the most boring, monotone person you've ever met in your life. Until I get interested in a topic, and then I will just spew this wall of knowledge at you about that subject. You know, more than you ever wanted to know about this subject. Probably you never wanted to know anything about it, but I knew it, right? And I want to share it with you. And that's the only thing I ever get excited about is things that I know, learning, knowledge. Um, I love learning. I love I love knowing things and I love learning. And if there were a way to monetize that, that would be fantastic. But Like being um, a professional student? Yes, that would be amazing. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to need like a minute to think. Yeah, yeah, process. I'm ready for you. So, you know, Anthony, my first reaction is that I would expect to feel emotionally worse listening to your story. Like, it sounds like you've been... So, you know, once again, we don't diagnose things on stream, but there's one diagnosis that comes to mind, which is a diagnosis that one of, um, so there was a nurse who worked in the emergency room where I trained or did most of my emergency shifts. And so she was like, awesome is awesome. I presume I'm I'm sure she's still working there. So she was like older, wiser. You know, I think a lot of times, uh, we think about doctors as experts, but In my experience, like wisdom comes from nurses more often than not. And, and so I think that, um, she had an interesting diagnosis. So sometimes we'd see that these people, honestly, like yourself, to to be completely honest, like 16 year old, usually adolescents, uh, a list of different diagnoses, um, a list of like, you know, you look at their like chart and it's like, they were in this foster home, went to juvie for a year. Like we'd get these like 17 year old kids really nasty to talk to, you know, like you go into the room and they're, they're like, you know, kind of acidic, uh, not pleasant. Um, and so her diagnosis was shit life syndrome. So it's not any of the fancy stuff that's in the chart. It's not depression. It's not bipolar. It's not substance use. It's not trauma. Like they have all of those things, but the real diagnosis is shit life syndrome. And it was one of the most like eye-opening um, kind of like teaching points for me that like we can put all kinds of labels on you, right? But like I don't think that any of those labels actually capture who you are. Um, you know, convicted felon. Um, you know, Chad with a 4.0 GPA without studying computer science. You know, like 
there are all kinds of labels like trauma victim, like absolutely, like all those labels check out, you know, I, I, I don't think cerebral is another example. I don't think they're all bad. Um, someone who can't forgive, which I think is fair enough. I don't think you should try very much harder, to be honest. But I don't think any of those are who you are. And so oddly enough, like what I see is like a dude who's basically had some like really, really bad luck. Have you made some bad choices? Sure. But I don't know that you were ever taught what a good choice is. Um, you know, should you be held responsible for shooting someone? Absolutely. And yet, should you also, should we also like, I don't know how else to say this. I don't think we should overreact to that data point in determining who you are. Right? It's an That's action. Like, is it a bad action? Is it a horrific action? Is it an action that you may never get forgiveness for? Sure. I think all of those things are correct. I'm not implying otherwise. And at the same time, it's still an action. Is it a catastrophic one? Absolutely. But I don't think it determines who you are. And this is where, like, you know, I draw a little bit on, on kind of Eastern philosophy. And I think a big part of that is that the human ego identifies with actions. You cannot be a failure. That's not a thing. You can fail, but you can't be a failure. But the human brain, and especially our ego, our ahamkar, identifies with our actions, right? So even if you like look at me and you say, like, I'm a doctor, like, that's not a real thing. Like, very precisely, how do you know that someone is a doctor? Well, I have like a piece of paper that has a medical degree. But I would be the first to say the moment I got that medical degree is not the moment I became a doctor. It happened like six months later. But I, I like know when it, but it, it's not anything that you can measure. I mean, you can because there's a societal, you know, agreement that I'm a doctor. Um, but I, as, and so I think that like a lot of this is like, there's a lot of stuff here for sure. And a lot of it's bad for sure. Have you been through a lot? Absolutely. Has that screwed you over in some very fundamental ways like absolutely so like did you miss core developmental milestones that help you understand like how to engage with other people yes oddly enough i find myself not being hopeless so i think that just hearing you and listening to you and like just like seeing the way that you relate like are you what i'm sort of getting the sense of is that you're How can I say this? I think 90% of what holds you back is what you've had to learn to survive. And so the good news is that, like, I think you can unlearn that stuff and you can, I, I'm not, I'm not kidding, Anthony, when I say you could on your 50th birthday, be married, have a stable job, be paying a mortgage and like live in the burbs. Like, I don't think that that's an unreasonable thing for you to have nine years from now. Right. Like, is it is it a long road? Sure. Is it going to be tough? Absolutely. Have you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps? It sounds like you're in the process. Are there a lot of oh, like so I, own, I own my own house right now? OK, out in the mountains. Uh, I got a beautiful house. Like, honestly, it's my dream house. It's it, it was it's still a crap hole, but it's I built this office myself, like every bit of it's coming along. So that's I'm making significant progress, but I just. I feel like that other person to share it with is a vital missing component. And, um, and, but it also fills me with dread, the thought of having to go out and uh, obtain that and, and, and put myself out there and, and share my life with somebody else. You know what I mean? That sounds very trying. Yeah. So w w what fills you with dread about finding someone? So every girl, every girl I've ever expressed any interest in only likes me as a friend or boy that she sure likes me like a brother. You know, I get that a lot. Friends um, okay. So you, and, you really are and, one of us. <laughs> right. And this is going to come off as judgmental, but that's only because I am judgmental and, and as shitty as that is, that's who I am as a person. And they try to hook me up with anybody. It's usually a bridge troll, to be honest. And it's like, is that how little you think of me that this is somebody you think I would be sexually attracted to? Right. I see your disgust on your face. And, and like I said, I'm a judgmental person, unfortunately. You see disgust on my fan. face? Oh, maybe I'm misreading. Maybe I'm misreading. What are you um, reading? I'm curious. 
But just when I when I when I said the thing about the bridge troll, you look for a disapproving look, perhaps. Perhaps I misinterpreted. Um, but it, nevertheless, um, those are my feelings, and uh, I must be true to myself. Um, I know I'm not that attractive, but I want okay. So I put myself at about a three, maybe, but I'm looking for like an eight. And so I have not, and but I also don't work out. I also don't go anywhere to where I can meet anybody. I also don't. Uh, I also don't actually talk to any women other than when they engage the conversation, like in a professional level or whatever the case may be. Or men. I'm, it's not just women. Don't get me wrong. I I don't have any friends. I I, I I'm pretty much a hermit shut in. I leave when I need to leave to go do something. I come back as soon as I can. And other than that, I, I'm content in my house. Um, uh, probably a lot of social anxiety. Uh, I, nah, I, I'm not even going to say that because I'm not going to self-diagnose. I don't know anything about it. Sure. So I, say it. I would like to, I would like, I would like to, like I said, come to terms with that aspect of myself or figure out a way to overcome it. Um, I would like to know who I am as a person. I know that's a lot to ask for, but um, what makes it a lot to ask for? I'll tell you. The question I always dread in a re in an interview: Tell me about yourself. I I don't know what's I don't have anything. I come up empty. I come up empty. I have no likes. I have no di I have not many dislikes. I have a couple of pretty specific ones, but not many dislikes. Um, I'm pretty indifferent about everything. I'm just like, I can take it or leave it. You want to go here? Let's go. I don't care. I have no opinion on the matter, right? Um, so I almost have no, I'm all, I feel like I almost lack a personality in a way, because if you were to ask me to list 10 things I'm interested in, physical things, not subjects that I can learn about, because I could list you a hundred of those. Why, why do you- Things that I can- <laughs> But why do you discount subjects from like things that you're interested in? Well, what I mean is, okay, so if you ask me 10 things I wanted to go out and do, actually do in the world, I would struggle with that. Okay. I would struggle with that. In general, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I just, I don't know who I am and I don't, I don't know how to start learning what I like in the world and what I don't like in the world because 1636, I was incarcerated, okay? Those are the years where you go to college. Those are the years where you're in your 20s and you're out doing whatever people in their 20s do. I've only seen sitcoms about it, so I don't know. Um, jail stunted him. Yes, butt form poker, butt form poker. That's exactly right. Um, jail stunted me. Um, I missed out on a lot of the, the, um, the, the, the experiences that people, that people have. And so... Okay, can you pause for a second, Know anything about the world. Yes, yes, oh, I Let can. me just, let me think, okay? Let me just compose my thoughts. Okay, so, let's think about what are the issues we're dealing with here, because there's a lot. Okay. Thank you, Builder Or. <laughs> Give me a second. Yes, please take all the time you need. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so let's, I'm just going to think out loud, all right? So you let me know. So you've given me a lot of pieces. I'm going to try to assemble them in some way. Um, feel free to jump in if you feel like there's a piece that doesn't fit properly. So the first thing is, you got born into shit life syndrome, okay? That's going to screw you in a lot of ways. So, like, let's think about the impacts of, like, so we get conditioned by our upbringing. And we get all this super basic conditioning, like how to relate to other people. Um, e even, like, how to understand what we feel. Uh, even, like, discovering what we discovering what we like and who we are. So who we are comes from external conditioning, actually. So like this is something, so let's just like take a step back and understand what's going on, okay? So when you're like a three-year-old kid, your brain is absorbing all kinds of stuff. It's like understanding like how does gravity work? Like what's the purpose of smiling? Like who am I? So identity in its most original form is actually formed by the reflections of people around us. So I don't know, like, if I'm a, if I'm a six-month-old, like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm feeling. All I know is that something is unpleasant. So it is the way that people relate to me that help me understand, oh, this unpleasantness is something called hunger. And if I, you know, get some food or drink some milk, like, then I will feel better. Maybe this unpleasantness is, like, I need a diaper change. So, like, the way that we make sense of the world and how we understand the world works is all like taught to us in our early upbringing, okay? So you're screwed there so far. We'll get to that, okay? You're not screwed forever. But I think, you know, in terms of how do I form relationships? How do I love someone? Like, I don't know that you know how to love someone. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, expand before you move on. Yeah, sure. So... I try to get love by buying people things. I try to keep friendships by buying people things with money or extravagant gestures, and it never works. Um, I find that all my friendships end the first time I say no to some outrageous favor that I don't want to do. Uh, they fall off the face of the earth. And so that's how I relate to love. Please carry on. Yeah, so that's case in point, right? So like, th that's what I'm saying is like, I, I don't think you were ever taught like how to form a healthy relationship. And so you're going to enter into these self-fulfilling prophecies of like enter into a relationship. And so cerebrally, like this is hard because essentially what you're doing is your intellect is like carrying you upstream against like a tide of like empathic blindness. So you don't know like normal humans. And I don't, I don't mean to be denigrating when I say that, but I, I, I genuinely do think that you've like missed some mate, like regular opportunities. And when I, when I say that, I think it's important to acknowledge that because a lot of us like take this for granted, right? Like I grew up with two loving parents. So like, it wasn't hard for me to learn how to love my kids because I was taught, like, I know how to interact with a two-year-old because I've been on the receiving end of it. Right. I'm not trying to make a comparison. I'm just saying that I've come to appreciate so many advantages that I had that like other people don't have. And if we want to fix a problem, we have to start by understanding like where it comes from. So I think you missed a lot of different milestones. So there's like concrete work that you need to do about learning how to behave in a relationship. Um, you know, how to understand even what you feel, um, discovering like who you are. So I want you to imagine that, you know, when you've got a six year old who goes to like t-ball practice and hits a home run then like the way that people respond to that six-year-old helps that six-year-old like understand who he is right so like that six-year-old then is like oh i'm a champion cool and then the six-year-old goes around and tells people i'm a champion i'm a champion i'm a champion and if he has poor parents they will encourage him to think that he is a champion and better than all other human beings and he will become a spoiled brat if he has parents that are a little bit better or other people like or other kids who are like, hey, you're not a champion. I'm a champion. Then, you know, like he'll learn over time that, OK, I can be a champion, but like other people can be champions, too. There's just so much like subconscious programming that goes on with like healthy human relationships. And our brain is sort of wired to like absorb this stuff like a sponge. And I think that unfortunately, like your brain absorbed a lot of bad things or like unfortunate lessons. Right. Like like in terms of how you establish relationships, 
how you deal with dissatisfaction within relationships, right? So like it's yelling at people, blaming others. I think that you have some of that programming baked in, but through virtue of your cerebral nature and self-reflection and like a lot of, for lack of a better term, spiritual work, I think you've learned how to not be those things. But I would not be surprised if under periods of stress, some of those behaviors activate. So you're not uh, instantly, your... instantly, Tell I me instantly about that. go to anger when I like under stress, I, I either shut down. Yep. Is the best I can describe it. Almost like when I burst into tears, as weird as that sounds like a child, like just helplessly like, ah, or the anger, you know, I was backing out of a spot at McDonald's and the car behind me honked. You know, I stopped my car. I put it in the park. I got out. I went up to the car and I started screaming at that car. What are you honking about? And only when the window rolled down and I realized it was a woman with a little girl in there did I say, oh, I apologize. And I got back in my car and I went about my business. And that's not me generally. I, that very much surprised me. I have to be honest. And I didn't even feel like I was under a, a particularly lot of stress. Um, but, you know, I also find myself binge eating late at mm -hmm. night. Um, I'm a chronic heavy drug user right now of marijuana from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, I'm high. Um, and so I'm like, am I binge eating or do I have the munchies? Cause, <laughs> cause what's funny is it, it, maybe you can help me answer this because I'll get up and I'll find myself in the fridge binge eating. And I look at the clock and it's always about 1103, 1104 at night. Like 11 o'clock comes and all my restraints fall. And if I'm still watching YouTube at that time, I ain't going to sleep till like three in the morning. Isn't that like, is that a thing where after a yep. certain time you're restrained out? Oh, that, that yes, doesn't make sense. it's absolutely a thing. So if let's just talk about binge eating for a second. So I'm the same way, by the way, well, uh, 10 to 11 is my time too. And, and so this is where if we, so our brain has impulses. And as our brain gets fatigued, especially our frontal lobes, our ability to restrain impulses goes down. So if you look at, for example, like, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, it's easier to go to bed at 10 sometimes than it is at like 12 or 1. Because like at 10, even though you're less tired, you have enough like frontal lobe function that you can restrain your ability to stay up. And then once you cross into like, midnight and then your brain is fatigued you can't pull yourself away from things as powerfully right right so we, we absolutely see an increase in impulsive behavior and binge eating because your brain is just tired and you can't control yourself anymore right like you're fatigued um but uh, yeah so like, like i said i i think that you know as, as you get under periods of stress like that programming is kind of baked in it's very like subconscious in terms of how your neurons have been wired and like you know, when I feel mad, when I feel frustrated, or when I feel frightened, because I can imagine that actually your physiologic response is one of a startling and fear, and then adrenaline pops through your system, and then like your brain is like, kind of goes into fight or flight mode. And since you spent 20 years in prison where flight is an option, That's you've, not an option right? you've adapted to fight with when you have an adrenaline response, right? So now I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because I, I want to start with like, let's start with, let's say, shit life syndrome, which you're going to have a lot of, it's an uphill battle, bro. I'm sorry to say, like, it's just an uphill battle. That, that's just the truth of it. The second thing is that I think that what's happened is you've adapted to your circumstances. So you've learned how to survive, right? And like learning how to survive involves a second layer of programming. Which is, you know, how do I deal with conflict? Well, like, you know, you shiv someone because like that's what you got to do in prison. And, and so, you know, in that moment, like this is like, it, it's not in a sense, it's kind of not your fault because your brain has been wired a particular way. I still think you're responsible. But, you know, if you think about the instinctual reaction of like fight or flight and how you respond to that, if we think about, you know, like a veteran who was in a war who's got PTSD and then a door slams and they like they think they're under attack. Our brain is wired and responds a particular way. So I think half of what we're dealing with is shit life syndrome. Half of what we're dealing with is the adaptations to shit life syndrome. And this is where I think actually there's a lot of stuff that you can work on. So, um, you know, you, 
I, I think that in some ways, uh, uh, Anthony, you're very cerebral, but I also think it sounds like you're incredibly rigid. You don't sound open-minded to me. So I, I think that this is where... Please expand. So like, like, I think in some directions you're willing to learn, but once your mind gets made up, so like when you talk about anti-Semitism, for example, oh, yes. Yes, or you yes, talk indeed, about yes. other things, or like when you talk about the bridge trolls... You know, so so it's interesting because you're open minded, like except for some issues, in which case I'm a three and I deserve an eight. And like, there's a lot there. You know, I I, I wasn't responding with no a seven. deserve hope to get. But no, you're absolutely right about the rigidity. Thank you. And you're and you, the way you put it was perfect. Once my mind is made up, because I don't make up my mind easily. In fact, yep. I, that's something I have a very hard time doing. Yep. But once I make up my mind, it is made up. So, so then I think the the challenge there is that I want you to think for a second, take a step back and imagine all of the conclusions that you have been forced to accept over the last, let's say, 30 years, right? And so what's happening is you've got a lot of conclusions which have been made up for a good reason, but like they're, they're adaptations to situations which you don't exist in anymore. Right. So like the way that you relate, like the way that you love someone is like confusing because you clearly love your mom. She taught you what love is and she was incredibly abusive. So, you know, I, I imagine that it's going to feel very strange for you if you ever go on a date and like someone expresses compassion. And so then what you end up doing is like, you, you know, you play the game the way that your intellect has told you it's to be played. Which is like, okay, how do I get someone to like me? I like do things for them. That's what happens in a relationship. But then you sort of enter into the self-fulfilling prophecy, which is kind of like bullying, where there's something, in, and I hate to break this to you, but I think you are the common denominator. That's an interesting thing. Okay, so let's just talk about this for a second. Because when, when a lot of times people's shame and sense of failure kind of piles onto this idea of being a common denominator. But I think there's a really tricky thing to understand is that if you are the common denominator, the power to change is also in your hands, right? That's interesting. Yeah, that's true. So, so like if you kind of think about it, and let's just be honest because your intellectual mind is saying, hey, I'm the common denominator. Like it's something to do with me. And that's where you have to be kind of careful because if you've grown up with bullying, what – your mind automatically does is, oh, it's like my fault and there's something fundamentally wrong with me. But chances are it's some kind of behavior, right? Like, so as you kind of noted that kids can get a lot of social status by standing up to you. And so early on, you know, you didn't respond to kids in a particular way, which like sort of sets you out as a target. And then when you go to prison, you realized, oh, like I can't be a target anymore. And then you kind of swung the pendulum the other way. And then you're yelling at, you know, moms in the McDonald's parking lot because like, damned if because you had to learn that it was like survival it was adaptation right and th th that's going to echo and so probably what you're dealing with is some combination of the two where at times you feel like you know the other shoe is going to drop and like no one is going to care about you and you're going to wind up getting bullied and like if people express compassion you know like you don't know how to handle it um and then on the flip side maybe you go into survival mode but it's like really hard to be like kind of tranquil and in the middle because I think the really interesting thing is like, you know, how do you think you are coming across in this interview? I, I don't know. I, to be honest with you, I'm trying to drop all my guards and just be as honest as I can. So I'm not really even trying to focus on that. I understand that. So how does that feel? Fine, because you're a complete and total stranger and I'll never see you. Nor will I ever see anybody in chat. Would I share any of these things with somebody I would ever see again? I, I think no. I, I would have a really hard time un, un, so, unburdening myself like that. So let's play this tape through to the end. If we were going to see you, what? so like you're, like you're saying that there's no consequence because we're never going to see you again, right? Right. Let's right. pretend that we're, I'm going to see, like, we're going to see each other. We're going to like hang out once a week for the next four weeks. What would you be afraid of me believing about you after this conversation? Like, what do you think you're, how do you think you're coming across? It's 
smart, maybe. I, 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 I'm at a loss. I just, I don't understand how other people know things like that. I don't know the answer to your question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that that's totally fine. You don't need to. So I, I think that's kind of telling because I want you to just point, I want to point out to you that you're afraid of being judged, right? That's why you would, you're like, it's, you're afraid of being judged. But as we tunnel down into what is the judgment that you're afraid of, you come up empty. Right, so this in general, all right. Uh, so this is really important, Anthony. So what that means is that the fear that you have is like an echo from a primitive state of your brain. So like there's like it, it, there's no there's no like nuance or specificity to it. It's just like a, I can't tell people how I feel, otherwise bad shit happens. You know, like the one time you're authentic with your mom and you're like, wow, it sounds like you have trouble relating to people at work. It's just like a simple observation that's completely authentic and boom, you're screwed. So I think almost like a PTSD kind of thing where you're you've learned that like being authentic with people is tough. But let's be straight, bro. Like you're calling women bridge trolls. You're voicing being anti-Semitic. You know, you're telling people that you killed someone. And... Are, I think, generally speaking, people like you. Like, I think, I don't think that, like, chat, I don't know, I'm not looking at chat, and I encourage you not to, but I think that, like, you know, people can respect you, despite these things that are negative, and I think part of that comes from, like, owning the things that are negative in your life, right? And so I think there's a really tricky thing, and this is kind of how I would recommend you move forward, is that you keep on putting on a mask, whereas, like, if you really want to form a connection with someone, you have to, like, let people in on the inside, and then it's terrifying because then we may think you're a racist asshole, which you could be. But just because oh, yeah. you're, yeah. But cool. I'm also a good person. I feel like there's yeah. a dichotomy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Right. So I think that people can be, you know, you can. The, people are not like black or white. And so I, you know, I would. We'll get to the rigid, rigid thinking and, and stuff later. But so I, I think it's kind of interesting because what you're afraid of is like you're literally like having a conversation with thousands of people on the internet and and you're like being relatively authentic. I don't get the sense that you're BSing us. Um, and you're afraid of some consequence, which makes perfect sense. But at the same time, like the more that you tunnel down into like, oh, what are they going to think? And you're like, I don't really know. So then it's like a very primitive fear that doesn't actually have like legs to stand on. Does that make sense? Well, it's rejection. I know what I'm afraid of. It's rejection because it's consistent. I've never successfully asked a woman out or a girl out through school or is it, I've never successfully managed that. The one time I had sex, I, I was in my brother's town and she was just the very friendly girl in town who was pretty much the man maker. Um, if you went to her house, you were pretty set. So that's how that went down. And it was awkward and uncomfortable and, and, and embarrassing. And I did not enjoy it. I got zero enjoyment out of it. Zero. Um, so. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so here's what I'm getting the sense of, like, uh, honestly, Anthony, what I feel more than anything else talking to you is that you're dormant. Like I get the sense that there's, there's a whole life in person and like positivity that's just been like slumbering and you just haven't had the chance to like wake up and really like be for lack of a better term. And so I think, you know, when you were t talking about like motivation and feeling lazy, like I wasn't worried at all. I think you're, uh, the problem is that there's just nothing to motivate you. Like, so I I'm pretty sure that when a challenge kicks in, you'll be fine. Like, I think that you're going to do great. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So when the challenge kicks in, you're going to find out that your habits are lacking. But I think generally speaking, my recommendation to you, if you're lazy, is like, do more, not less. Like, don't, if you don't feel motivated, don't go hunting for artificial motivation. I know it sounds kind of weird. Don't just like wake up every day and be like, oh my God, like I need to do the dishes because like that's motivation. I'm going to find my internal self. I'd say... You've missed out on life. You've missed out on 41 years of life, basically. So what I'd say first and foremost is like start living, right? Like that's your job. Forget about purpose. Forget about making the world a better place. You have missed out. So missed out on all kinds of things, being challenged, failing. Even then, I know you say you've gotten rejected a lot, but I don't think that you've ever gotten rejected. Maybe you have, but I feel like every failure you've had has been part of a rigged game. I don't know that you've ever been on your A game 
and really been the best human you can possibly be when you ask out a girl. I don't know that you've had a career and like, you know, been in shape and, and like, you know, done some emotional work and like worked with a therapist. Like, I don't think that you've, you know, you've never played a fair fucking game. So you got to be super careful about the identity of I am a failure when you've never played a fair game. And something tells me, so I'd say that, you know, programming is going to get harder. You can slide through with 4.0s for now, but I'd say, let it get harder and then rise to the challenge and then keep climbing and eventually you'll equilibrate. And I think that'll be like fulfilling for you. Even if you don't love programming, at least you're not going to be fucking bored, right? Because your enemy right now is like idleness Boredom. and, and yes. you're, you're slumbering. Like, I feel like I'm talking to a slumbering giant. And I don't know if you're going to turn into a programmer. I don't know if you're going to do like analytics for like Cambridge Analytica and, and you know, help promote anti-Semitism around the world or like whatever you end up doing, you know, but I think something <laughs> challenging is going is, is to is gonna engage you, right? And is going to demand of you like what you look at that now. This is a facial expression. We haven't seen at all. What is it? What, what do you feel? Smile? Like? No, you've smiled. Oh, I laughed. you this is different. You made a really good joke. And then I was thinking that would be great if I could put that into action. But unfortunately, I don't feel like my anti-Semitism is an exportable, an exportable <laughs> good. I, I'm pretty sure that some people would disagree with you. But I think what I saw for the first time, Anthony, was excitement. We've seen you smile. We've seen you laugh. I don't think I've ever seen excitement. And even now, you're kind of lagging. So it was frozen and kind of an excited frame. Really? But I, I think I got a touch. I wasn't sure. But, you know, I, I think that there's there's something when I when I speak about this stuff, I get that there's like actually like a very, very, there are a couple embers buried in the coals. You know, like there's a bunch of ash and there's something down there that I think just needs to wake up. So practically, I'd say keep studying CS by all means. Um, you know, you'll rise up. I think also in terms of like sexuality, I think there's been a lot of dormancy. Right. Uh, when I kind of think about it, it's sort of like you're rusty, you know, so so it, it, and not it, rusty isn't just in terms of a physical sense, like a lot of sexuality has to do with like emotional intimacy and things like that, which I think that you're rusty on or never really learned how to do. Um, I do think I, there are a couple of really high points. I know this sounds kind of weird, especially if we're talking about sexuality, but really not related. But I think your hitchhiking experience really gives me hope. Because what I'm what I'm really hearing from that experience is that you met like random people and you were able to connect with them in like an authentic and and like meaningful way. Right. And like even when you talk about it, like it's some of the best years of your life. And like, why was that? It's because you didn't have to worry about what people thought. Right. Like you were just you and like you were didn't have a house, didn't have a job like you were a nothing. You don't have to give anyone any gifts. And what did they do for you, Anthony? They helped me. Absolutely. And so just think about that for a second. That like mm. when you are who you are and you have nothing to give and they don't owe you anything. That they see something within you that is worth helping. And I see it too. I'm pretty sure all of chat sees it too. Is that you are absolutely someone who is scary and also worth helping. You know, you're, you have a certain like cranky bareness to you. And there's I guess also that a lot that am I upset, but I think I just have resting bitch face because right now I feel completely no, this is a neutral face. For yeah, me. you certainly, but that too is also like adaptive, right? Where like you want to have neutral affect. So people who grow up in abusive households learn how to become invisible. Like, cause being noticed in some way is like, you know. Bad. I can imagine in prison, resting bitch face helps you. Like it's actually quite adaptive. And so I think the biggest oh. problem, uh, Anthony, that I think you, you have to face, and this is going to be hard, is there's a life. Like there's absolutely a life. I'm not worried about that at all. I think the problem is that discovering that life requires you to undo all of the things that, how can I say this? When you go to prison at the age of 16, and that feels like 20 life sentences, the only way you can survive that is to numb yourself to the prospect of life. Yeah. I don't need life anymore, right? That's the only way you survive your 18th birthday in prison, 21st birthday in prison, 30th birthday in prison, 35th birthday in prison. 
The only way you survive that is by giving up on life entirely and saying like, I have to- That's exactly what I did. Yes, you're I exactly have to, right. Any kind of joy, goal, hope, hope, hope you have to needs to hope. be- Hope is dead. Need, not just dead, you had to kill it, bro. Right? When a tiny bit of hope on your 21st birthday- I don't dare hope. Don't you don't dare, dare hope. Dare hope. hope. Hope keeps wanting to sprout up in your garden like a weed and there you are every yes. day plucking it out. And then you you wind up and you're asking like, I don't know what to get out of life. And like, that's right, bro, because you spent 20 years doing your level best to get nothing out of life. Right? So I, I don't think, and I know it sounds kind of weird, but I, I don't think you need to actually discover what you want from life. I don't think it's this deep, personal journey that you have to like go and spend time in the Himalayas and things like that to like discover what you want in life. I think all you've got to do is stop pulling out the weeds and you've gotten so good at pulling out the weeds that, you know, it'll, it'll come up. And this is where, you know, I think there are a lot of things that you're doing that are quite amazing. Like 4.0 GPA in, in computer programming is not easy. I imagine for a 41 year old dude to do right. Like, so you've got, you've definitely got like things in your corner that are working for you. And so oddly enough, I think your road forward is not about like doing more. It's actually about stopping to do what you have learned how to do. Um, is that, can I keep going? Yes, please do. Okay. So a couple of things to think about practically. So I think you've got to think long and hard. I'm going to zero in on the bridge troll for a second. Okay. You've got to think long and hard about some of these things that you accept for yourself, which I think you really need to reconsider. So the first is like, in your mind, you're a three. I don't think you're a three. Maybe you are. I don't know. I'd like, I'd like stick you at a five, okay? And that you want an eight and that's fine. But I think that when you really think about what's important to you in a relationship, you don't sound like you're horny all the time. You know, you don't sound like, like you're, I mean, it sounds like you want someone who, you know, if I could find someone for you, it's not so much about the physical attractiveness as it is about someone who can kind of like just listen to you talk about stuff, right? Like you just need well, someone. Well, no, because I like a conversation. I like a, I like a smart person who can give back as good as they receive. I like a conversationalist. Sure. So if that's what you like, and I suspect that that's actually, I know you like it, but I don't know if that's what you need. I, I think what you need is probably like a good woman who makes you think she, you're having a conversation. But is actually just letting you talk. And I say this as someone who's being married to one. I, I know what it's like to be someone who likes to talk and likes to think that they have a conversation. But really what we like to do, people like us, Anthony, we just like to talk. Right? Talking is great, yes. And, and, and we like to think we're having a conversation. But if someone's, you know, letting us speak our piece about how the Jews are ruining everything. Like, you're going to love that. That's what you're, that's what you're going to want. <laughs> yes, I go okay. on those tangents sometimes. I do go on those tangents. Um, you know, I, I... So it's like a cerebral... May, maybe you can help me with this, because it's like a cerebral wanting a family. It's like a cerebral wanting a wife. But really, it's I want to impress other people. And I think everything I do is is in an attempt to impress. And I was actually, this was just something that came to me the last two, three days. I was thinking, you know, when I was a kid, I was a, I was a compulsive liar, like outrageous lies. Not that I invented the question mark, but uh, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, I said, I, I was probably 11. I said, I threw like 120 mile an hour fastball. And of course, everybody said I was full of shit because I knew nothing about baseball whatsoever and i was just trying to impress people and it feels like every decision i make so i wanted the car what will other what will what will other people think of it will other people be impressed by it? will it make other people yeah i, I, I yeah I, I feel like i i feel like i try to impress people or the other way i say things that are shocking yep right is it just attention seeking behavior or don't No, what it is is it's it's fucking distraction from what you really are. Right? So you want to go you want to show people the best parts of you or the worst parts of you as long as they don't see you. Oh. That is interesting. Well, I, but I feel like I have nothing to offer. 
Yep, that's why you don't want people like, to see it. I have no that, opinion. So like I said, I have no opinion. No, of course you have I, opinions. That's not, true. I mean, that's not true. That's not true. I have no like. But hold on a second. Strong preferences? No, hold on, hold on. But there's another problem that you're doing, which is you're setting up a rigged game for yourself. When okay. you say, like, so earlier we had this conversation about, like, I'm not interested in anything. And right. then you, like, you walked yourself back and you're like, no, I'm interested in hundreds of things. If you asked me about an activity, I wouldn't be able to come up with a single one. So it's right. like, here's, here's the test. You're able to pass this test. And so some part of your mind is like, fuck that. We don't want to pass the test. Let's pick the one that we're going to fail. Huh. Right? Whereas like who you, you may just not be like a doer. You're like a thinker. You're like a philosopher. You're like one huh. of these guys that like thinks deep Wait, thoughts. Is that okay? Yeah, of course it's okay. Uh, how, do you, how do you live like that? You hang out with other people who can have conversations with you. How do you, how do you feed yourself like that? How ah. do you physically make money how do you make money like that how do by you being live? a thinker yeah so Who's paying people to think i mean so any author who writes a book is someone that oh, people fair, are paying to fair. think okay 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 fair enough gotcha. right i got it yeah any That's any video true. essayist on Same youtube you. you're a thinker yeah you're absolutely right yeah it's right? just you have to i have to be a little more imaginative with the medium yeah you're absolutely right so I'm not saying you should steer away from computer programming. I think it's a really good no, step. No, no, I'm on that path, right? Yeah, yeah I'm on that but, path. But sure. I, th I think long term, and this is also where like who you are and how you get paid ideally will will get together. But honestly, bro, from like how far behind you are, I wouldn't shoot for that yet. Okay. You know, I, I think there's lower hanging fruit. I'm not going to tell you. I, okay. Maybe it's a mean thing to say, but I wouldn't shoot for, you know, you've just got so many like people who can afford to be thinkers. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes don't have, they have some advantages that you're playing with a handicap. So I'd, I'd like shoot and you, by all means, like we should cry over that if anything, right? That life is uh, so fucking unfair to you that other people have opportunities that you may not have. But on the flip side, I could absolutely totally see a really interesting kind of angle of, Hey, I killed someone for 20, you know, I spent 20 years in prison. Here's how I made sense of my life. Like you could wind up on fucking Oprah and, and, you know, lifetime and like, you could like put your life, like you could go down that route, right? A lot of people are looking for guidance. And if you're able to find it, you may be able to help other people as well. Like, I don't know. Right. When I say Asperger's, does that do anything for you? Because uh, I read the descriptions of all these various ailments and they all seem to match me perfectly. So that's kind of useless. Yeah. So here's, but... here's, here's what I'll say about Asperger's. Okay. So if you want, that's where you should really get a full mental health evaluation, but what I will say is that if you look at the symptoms of Asperger's, there are uh, many things that can contribute to those kinds of symptoms. Like I've already explained to you, you know, a lot of hypotheses besides Asperger's or autism spectrum that can contribute right. to your cognitive and empathic and friendship difficulties. Certainly. So the symptoms of Asperger's or autism spectrum have multiple causes. So sometimes Roger. it's autism spectrum, but frankly, we see this in the gaming population as a whole. I was talking to literally like my pediatrician, the pediatrician of my kids, and she was saying that as technology usage has increased, she is getting like more Asperger's like presentations from children. But she doesn't think that all these kids are on the spectrum. She thinks it has something to do with the way that they interact with technology and how it shapes mm. their brains in terms of like social interactions. Mm. So that science is really interesting. I'd say that, you know, we'll get to concrete recommendations about mental health treatment in a second, but um, going back to like impressive. Yeah, please. And at the murder thing, I, I don't want to make light of it. Somebody lost their life. And I see people joking in chat about I'm going to make a YouTube channel, real life murder. No, that's somebody lost their life. And I was messed up that I did that. That's not something I even like to talk about, much less use as a as a form of advertisement or I caused that family a lot of pain. And that's really messed up that I did that. Sure. Sure. So I, I, I completely agree with that, but I, I think it's important to also acknowledge that that's the way the internet is, right? That we live in a world where if you did something like that, there are going to be people who due to schadenfreude or voyeurism or sure. like, because like, sure. they're all looking for something like, you know, they're just like you said, they're like addicted to YouTube and they're looking for something that's going to like excite them and make them feel something. So I know it sounds kind of weird, but I think that your karma your karma has set you up in a very unique way that I think could be an advantage. I know it sounds kind of weird. 
I think it's hard to make that case. And I mean, overall net disadvantage, absolutely. But it still makes you the person that you are. And I think the person that you are, I mean, you have such a unique perspective on life that could be very educational to people. Like I've learned a lot, you know, and I do this, this is my job. And I've still learned a lot. I've worked in prisons for months and I've never had a conversation with anyone in prison the way that I've had with you. Because most of the time they're not as cerebral as you are, unfortunately, right? They haven't. Well, no, and I wouldn't. I had one come to try to talk to me when I was like seventeen, and, and I wouldn't. I always thought therapists were for pussies, were for were for fakers, people who just wanted attention or to cry and feel sorry for themselves. I think that was just more a mom's mom's upbringing, right there, because sure. that's kind of what she instilled in me is that you know it's every man for himself. You got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You better keep your mouth shut. Nobody wants to hear you cry. Yeah, you know I mean. You just suck it up. And so that's kind of that's kind of the that's kind of the philosophy I lived under most of my life. So can we go back to impressing people for a second? Because I think there's a lot here. Yes, carry on. So so I I think that um, when it comes to impressing people, like I think it makes sense because you know, you're concerned for good reason that what you are on the inside, people aren't gonna like, right? So like when you were five and you don't know how to put on a mask. Your mom was like really cruel to you. Your brother was like pretty neglectful. You know, I wonder a little bit about whether he was, you know, since you were the favorite, whether he resented you for that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff there where you learned early on that like who I am is like not an okay person. And then that gets reinforced by, you know, going to prison and putting on a mask and this kind of stuff. And then you sort of also gets reinforced when you start like doing really nice things for people and you begin to see like, oh, if I give people gifts, like, they're going to like me and they'll want to hang out with me. This is how this game is played. It's all very cerebral, right? So I think that as a result, you're going to want to impress people because there's probably also, if we want to just be blunt about it, there's some amount of shame, right? Because you're a 41-year-old dude. You got laid like 25 years ago. You know, a lot, a lot you know, of it. there's a lot of that crap. And so to compensate for all of that stuff, there's going to be like, I want to, because I feel like I'm down here. If I impress people to this level, I'll end up somewhere in the middle where I can be comfortable, you know, even if I, and so there, there's a lot going on there. And so I'm not surprised that you'll also swing to the other end of the spe- spectrum, because if you, I don't know how to say this, but if you advertise something really terrible you've done, and then people hate you for it, that's the reason they hate you. It's not because well, that's you're fu- understandable. That's exactly. Reason, it's right. not because there's something broken and unfixable and deep down and part of your DNA that right. if people saw like you would be absolutely terrified if they hated you for that. But you're fearful that there's something within me that like if I le- ever let people see. So then what you do is you advertise all this negative crap. And it actually protects you both ways. Either way, what's happening is no one is getting an authentic you. Mm. And so the tricky thing there is, you know, I think stepping away from all of this stuff is so you try so hard. You're trying to figure out who am I? Well, like, I think all you need to do is stop moving away from it and you'll figure it out. I think actually we know who you are. I feel like I have a pretty good sense of who you are. Can Um, you share? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're, I think you're the dormant philosopher. I think that you like to think big thoughts. You like to have your thoughts challenged. You want to have, you want to put your thoughts out into the world and you want to have respect for the quality and excellence of your thoughts. I resonate with all of that. Yep. That it's who you are, bro. Right? Like you want to say to the world, like, I'm going to work really, really, really hard at this and I'm going to make it awesome and I'm going to show it to you and y'all are going to fucking think it's awesome too. The day that you're able to do that, I think is going to be the opposite end of the spectrum of when you were suicidal and trying to find a reason to wake up tomorrow for tomorrow. As long as you're moving in that direction, you're going to fight to stay alive. And the problem is that you've just been given such a shitty circumstance that that part of you has never had a chance to like exist in the world. Because who's going to listen to an ex-con? Who's going to listen to this guy? Who's going to listen to like, it, dude without a shin? Your mind is going to fill in all these different reasons why no one has had a chance to li- reason to listen to you. But you have a lot to say, and it has immense value. What do you think about that? 
I think that'd be fantastic. Um, if anybody wanted to talk to me about anything, that'd be great. Yep. So, so, and I think this is the tricky thing. So now we get to like the rigidity, right? So you have to be careful because the ego, I think, is shooting you in the foot in some ways. So when, you know, someone, when you're attracted to someone because they're an eight and you want to impress everyone because, you know, this person's an eight and you want to go on a date with them and they say, Hey, I think you should really meet my friend. Who's probably not a three. She's probably not a, maybe she really is a bridge troll, but I suspect that your mind is warping her attractiveness. And the second thing is like, you're not like a super sexual guy to begin with. And do you want a hot girlfriend? Sure. But I think it would be wonderful if you could like, because attraction is more than physical stuff, right? There's like intimacy, there's emotional stuff. People have very healthy, loving, sexually arousing relationships in their 70s. Like they do that. It's like normal, right? So I think a big part of that is is like you're not giving people a chance to like, you're, you're kind of writing yourself off, right? It's, it's back to this idea of here's the test that I can pass. Therefore, I'm going to throw that one out the window and let me find one that I can fail. And so when you talk about rejection from women, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know that you're also playing a fair game there where like maybe you are, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that you can't get an eight. Like, I think you can get an eight. I think it's going to take some work. But I think this is where other self-fulfilling prophecies c could come in because the eight shows up and you're so concerned about her not rejecting you that you do a lot of nice stuff for her. You meet her emotional needs while not asking for anything in return in an effort to get her to like you. And then she starts treating you like a friend because that's like, that's the thing, right? We're friends. Like friends are there for each other. Mm. And the start of the romantic relationship is like different. Like people usually make their intentions know early on, but this is how people kind of repeatedly get into the friend zone is you're afraid she's going to reject you. So you want to stack the deck in your favor by doing a lot of nice right. things. Yeah. Yeah, the friend zone. That's where I live. That's my yep. that's my address. So so you stack you stack up on your side to get her to like you in a particular like to get her to like you. So you're there for her, and then you know women. This is going to be a generalization, which you know I, anyone can sure. criticize me for fairly. But I think generally speaking, like women are better at offering emotional support and receiving emotional support without it having a sexual connotation to it. Whereas like, if you were like the things that you do for the women that friend zone you, you wouldn't do for your dude, your, your boys, uh, right? Uh, you uh, know, like, like you treat them differently. So like, there's, there's a tr interesting thing about emotional support and sexual intimacy, which men tend to tie together a little bit closer and women don't <laughs> broad sweeping generalization. That's very open to criticism. Right. Right. But I do think that the more you stack the deck in your favor to try to get someone to like you, the more likely you're, you are to end up in the friend zone. Well, so in this hypothetical scenario where I do have an eight or even a seven or six, I got to be honest, do you, I feel, and I would want to know if you feel as well, I, I fear I would be extremely insecure and jealous. But one time I had a girlfriend when I was a kid, I was ex massively insecure, like, like grossly so, like creepily, weirdly, psychotically so. Yep. You're only with me because you like my brother and, and, and. Yeah, so I don't know that I'm emotionally equipped for a for a relationship of any kind. You're you're Do not. You think that? Oh, you're okay, not. okay. So I'm I'm right then. Okay. Yeah, so I I don't think you're emotionally equipped for a relationship, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't start dating, and that also doesn't yeah. mean that you won't become emotionally equipped over time. Because if okay. you've gotten this far with this shitty hand of cards, like I think you could be emotionally equipped for a relationship in no time. Okay. Don't sell yourself short. You know, you haven't really been trying. I mean, I know you've been trying in your way. I don't think you've been engaged in a in a positive learning environment. That's what I'd call it, right? So, like, even if you end up, they re end up recommending what you call a three, it's probably closer to a five. And I think you should do your best to, like, go and have a conversation with the person. You don't have to sleep with them. Just try to go and, like, make a friend. Like, Fine. Well, that hasn't. By the way, that hasn't happened since I was six, 15, 14 years old. So this is nothing recent that has happened. Oh, yeah. So I. Uh, yeah. Okay. That, I don't that, even have any friends to. I don't even have any friends to refer anybody for me. Okay. I don't know how to make friends. I don't go anywhere, so that makes it hard. Yeah. But so I think to myself, okay, where do I go to meet people? Well, coronavirus happened, so okay, fair enough. 
But in normal circumstances, I don't know where one goes as an adult to meet friends, lovers, you know, just, just other adults. Yeah, so that's a challenging question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to table that for a second, okay? We'll Please. get to okay. concrete advice. Um, mm-hmm. So the last thing that I, I want to share with you is I think that, like, like you said, you're going to be very insecure if you enter into a relationship. So the question is, how do you learn how to be insecure? Right. So, and, and this is the challenge. Insecure or secure? Sorry, secure. So, That's so, okay. um, I, you know, and I think this is going to be tough, but I think this is where you got to work on the rigidity of your thinking. Okay. So like if your mind is telling you something and it's telling you, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. There's a general capacity to be less rigid with your thinking and be more flexible. So I, I know this is, this is, I, I say this not entire i say this with judgment okay so like Mm -hmm. if you can learn how to love a jewish person you will be no longer insecure so i I didn't really want to get into this but i don't hate the jews i just hate jews no maybe i mean it the other way i don't hate jews i hate the jews individually i have no opinion on them okay sure so I, think I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. If I can overcome something that I have made my mind up on. Exactly. So that's why it doesn't have to be the anti-Semitism, right? That's me taking a sucker punch at you. So I apologize for that. That's fair. That's fair. Totally um, fair. I knew I had it coming. So yeah, now, now that we've done it, we're, we're good, right? So the other thing is, I, I would say that you've made other statements. I keep on harping on that because maybe that bo- statement did bother me. So I should have I should have processed those emotions a little bit better. But, um, and maybe you did detect disgust. I'm sort of reflecting now. But I I think that uh, what I would say is that there are several things that you've said today where you're like, that's the way that I am, right? And Mm -hmm. I think flexibility around any one of those things, basically training yourself to be cognitively flexible, I think is the most important thing that you need to learn. Because I do think, I mean, it's not hard to figure out what you should do in your life. I think like to summarize, like, so here's what I'd say, Anthony. First of all, what you should, your purpose in life right now is to fucking live it because you haven't had a chance. So I'd say if you enjoy playing video games, play video games. Go and seek as many experiences as you can because like go eat burgers, you know, study computer programming, be at the top of your class, like get a fucking award with the day that you graduate, you know, like be on the honors list, do the things that kids normally go to their parents and are proud of. And then like, you know, do the things that make your parents brag about you. And then you're not going to have any parents to brag about you. And you're going to do that thing. And you're going to feel devastated and alone and fucking feel that shit too. And then pity yourself and let other people pity you and let other people have compassion towards you and let go of your like, you know, I, I don't know. There's some strength in there, which is like a strength of survival and let go of that. Let yourself be weak. You know, like feel all of those things and have someone to share that with and start to date and start to play video games and go for walks. You're in the mountains. Fantastic. Build shelves, like build your house, get a dog, do all of the things that life has not let you do. And in terms of who you are, read, think, write, study. And then you say, that's going to be hard because I have no one to talk with, which is exactly right. So I don't know. This is where practically, like you have to find people. You have to recognize that as you enter into places with people, there's going to be this tsunami of feelings that arises. Insecurity. What are they going to think? What, what, are, what do I have to say? How do I get them to like me? But you're not going for them to like you. You're just going to get food for your mind. Because the rigid, rigid thinking, especially on politics and stuff, if you're on the internet, like you're never going to get a contrary opinion or you're going to discount a contrary opinion, you know, like whatever. So just go and like, I don't know where you engage with people. So I'd say that, you know, sometimes there are like different kinds of classes and stuff like, um, you know, even I, it sounds like you're in school online, I assume, because of COVID and you're living in the mountains. Right, right. So, so this is where I don't know where your school is and, and, you know, whether it's a local university, but it's online classes. Yeah. So are in-person classes I could take. So not just in-person classes, I would look at in-person extracurriculars and you are going to feel like a weirdo because it's going to be a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids and you're going to be a 41 year old ex-con with tattoos, right? 
but like that carries a certain like gravitas and respect. They're all children and you're a man, you know? You may not feel like it on the inside, but it's kind of scary. And with your resting bitch face, you know, because your smile like really lights up your face. It, it, it does wonders for it, right? You've got a beautiful smile. And, and, and so I think even when you see it, there's like mischievous in, like there's mischievousness, right? There's playfulness there. There's excitement. And so I think all of those things you actually have to give to is the resting bitch face terrifying. Absolutely. Are you fucking ex con with tattoos? Like, absolutely. But the moment you smile, it all comes falling apart. And even to be able to smile like that, uh, Anthony, that's what you've missed, man. You know, I want to see, I, I want to say that your goal should be having that mischievous smile every day. Have a conversation with someone, play a trick on them, you know, pour some ice water down their back. Like, do whatever it is that like you haven't gotten to do. Have conversations with people. And I'd say if you want like a compass, try to go as close as you can to the person that you were and the way you interacted with people when you hitchhiked. Right? Because I think that that's, there's something about acknowledging that you may not deserve much, but you're going to give people a chance to give you something anyway. And what I'm really seeing right now is that, once again, you're holding yourself back. You're not giving people a chance to care about you. All you do is you put up facades that are guaranteed to get their respect and enjoyment. You're not giving people a chance. You're tricking them into engaging into a false relationship with you. Hmm. So go and do stuff. I'd say go see a medical doctor if you if you don't have one. You know, get yourself checked out, especially in terms of the sexuality stuff. So there are some medical conditions, like for example, low testosterone production can le lead to decreased libido. Part of the reason I was asking you about the leg muscles and the leg injury is because the largest source of endogenous testosterone in from the male body comes from actually the quadriceps muscles. So hmm. if people that I work with have low uh, testosterone, like I'll tell them to do like squats. If you want to, you know, get horny again, do squats. It's kind of interesting. Okay. So it's a very okay. endogenous kind of source of testosterone. There are other things in terms of sexuality, like just, you know, the brain, uh, you know, the body kind of like, you know, sh puts things on standby if they're not like regularly used, right? So for 20 years while you were in prison, we don't know what your sexual activity is like. I'm not going to ask Zero. you. Zero. But, Zero. you know, so your, your body's like, hey, we don't need this thing. So let's like shut it down for now. And you'll be surprised. It'll come back. So I do think in terms of hope, by the way, I do think that everything that I'm hearing, you have a lot of handicaps, but I don't think you're like the boy who was raised by wolves, right? I don't think you miss developmental milestones in such a crucial way to where you won't be able to engage in these things. And this conversation really reassures me because you seem like a quite a relatable guy. Like you seem like a good dude. Right? You're very in tune with facial expressions. You're very sensitive to different kinds of judgment. You're better at detecting my sensitive, my disapproval than I am. And I'm pretty fucking good at detecting myself. So that means you're an absolute beast. And we see this in people who are raised in traumatic households because you have, it's a survival for you. You have to be able to read your mom's facial expressions, right? Like whether you're going to get hit that day or not, like you need to know. So be careful because you're going to be interpreting a lot of information that people themselves are not going to be aware of. So oh. you you will see dislike in people's faces that they're not even aware of and may not even... Because I do. Huh? Because I definitely see the yeah. facial expressions and it's like, it's like, oh, well, I see where this is leading. Let me go ahead and exit with some exactly. grace while I still can. Exactly. And this is the thing, though. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but they're only there's only a 20% chance it's going to go where you think it's going to go. Hmm. Because the other thing about your brain, and there's been overwhelming research about this, is that your brain is also especially tuned to negative facial expressions. Sure, absolutely. So you're going to miss all of the positive facial expressions, and you're going to amplify all of the negative ones, which is in turn going to reinforce your insecurity, is going to cause you to stack the deck in your favor, and will set you up for a relationship on false pretenses, which is going to wind up in the friend zone. And I fear that I have women flirt with me and I have literally no idea they're doing it. I, I fear that does happen. And I would have no way of knowing. <laughs> yep. I, I believe it. You know, so 
I think very practically, Anthony, I think the first thing is to understand yourself and understand your rigidity and try to engage in a little bit of cognitive flexibility. Really start to question, and what does that mean practically? It means question your conclusions. Because like you said, you see where this is going. Hold on a second. Let's actually play the tape through to the end. Because when I ask you, I forgot what question I asked you about. Oh yeah, what are you afraid that, you know, why are you reassured that we're never going to meet again? What is the judgment that you're afraid I'm making? And like, it doesn't, there isn't one, right? So it's actually, there's this really tricky thing going on where like your insecurity is like shaping your thoughts and it feels logical to you. And it feels like, oh, this has happened a thousand times before. So I, I know I'm right. But like, it's all like, if you kind of, it's going to be smoke and mirrors. It's going to be a mirage. I'm like pretty sure about this stuff. That most of the problems that you see are going to be mirages when closely examined. Your insecurity is going to be a mirage, or there'll be some truth to it. Like, there's some good reason, you know, I'm missing a shin, I'm an ex-con, I'm 41 years old. You know, I may not be the, the, you know, the highest what most women are looking for, right? So there's some truth to that. We just have to acknowledge that. But I think that don't let those things define who you are, because you're so much more than that. Now, um, you, you mentioned that you, you imagine it might be hard for me to imagine myself as an adult inside. What, what made you say that? Because that's very true. I, I tell people I don't even know what I want to be when I grow up. And I, I'm only half joking when I say that. Um, what, 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 what brought you to that conclusion? Because that's exactly how I feel. So the first is that you weren't shown how to be an adult. So you don't know what it looks like. Right. And then the second thing is that you've missed a lot of the developmental milestones that people like that help people become adults. Oh, yeah, that's true. I get what you're saying. Yeah, you go right? to the weddings, you do that whole thing, the growing up. You go up, to right? prom or you ask a girl out for prom and she says no. You ask a girl out freshman year and she says no. You ask a girl out freshman sophomore year and she says yes. That's how you grow up. You, you graduate from college. You get a college degree. You know, you get your first job. You have a career. And then you're like adulting. You like talk with friends of yours. And this is your, it's going to be an uphill battle. Okay, Anthony, I hate to break it to you. But like, there's also like, you know, when you're 21 years old and you're like late night hanging out with your friends and you have a conversation about, I don't know if I want to be an electrical engineer. I really love art. And then you have a conversation about that and your friends are like, then you should do art. And then you wake up the next day and you realize how stupid it is to not be an electrical engineer. And you try to have a conversation with your parents that are like, that's idiotic. And then you decide to become an electrical engineer. That's how you grow up because you kill yeah. a tiny part of your childlike self on the inside. You know? mm -hmm. And so I think all those things, so I think it's a lack of modeling. And then also like you just haven't gone through the developmental milestones. The good news is that Generally speaking, data show, I don't know about data, but I guess I'm just making a conclusion. It's been my experience that missed milestones, you can catch up on very quickly. So I would not be surprised if four years from now, you felt like a 45-year-old and you were doing most of the things that a 45-year-old is doing. Sure. Do you think it's possible I only want friends and a girlfriend because that's what is expected by society is to have friends and a girlfriend to be normal? Yes, absolutely. I think that's half your problem is that you're trying to do trying what, to be normal. Yep. Is you're trying to do what you think you should be doing instead of actually doing what feels right to you. So why do you want the eight instead of the three? It's because the eight Other people is, would be impressed that I had yep. an eight. But you may actually, you may genuinely, if, if you got the eight to marry you and you got the three to marry you, I'm not convinced that you would be genuinely happier with the eight because I don't think that physical. You're more insecure, if anything, right? Case in point, right? You're the one who's telling me it's a bad idea. So like instead gravitate towards what is authentically you. But the problem is you've been weeding that shit out for so long. You don't even know what that is. Right, right, right. So I don't know who I am. Yeah, well, but so here's the thing. So you get, there's, there's, a tr there's a trick you can play. So as you okay. observe your thoughts and as you begin to realize that I want this eight because people will be impressed, then you know you should move in a different direction. If I'm doing it for external motivations. Okay, that's, that's great. That's really good insight. That's great. Right? So then be like, okay, hold on a second. What do I actually want? This is what I would feel secure with because everything in your brain, understand this, Anthony, when you've had trauma like yours, 
Everything in your brain is wired not for happiness. It's wired for safety and security. Mm. What have you never had? Fucking safety and security. Ever. Right. Right. So like everything you're going to be doing is going to be the safe route. Computer programming, like that's a safe pick. But I figure future proof, right? That's yep. exactly the logic that went into it. What is the most future proof job I could pick that I would be capable of doing and that a felony would not hamper as much? You're absolutely right. You're right. So it's it's all safety and security. And like safety and security is important. Don't get me wrong. I think it's it's a good choice. But at the end of the day, if that's where you're moving towards in your cognitive thought process, move the other way. Like I, I can almost guarantee you that if you start meeting women and stuff, you're going to meet a woman who is absolutely amazing and would be a wonderful partner. And she's going to be less attractive than what you would want. And really like look at yourself in that moment, examine that rigidity, you know, and it's not about security or any of that crap, to be honest. It's just like, do I enjoy spending time with this person? Do I enjoy having a conversation with this person? That's what's important. I mean, 25 years from now, like everyone's going to be ugly anyway. So it's, you know, what that's yeah, what I got. That's some good insight right there. That's what I got for you. That's much appreciated. I, I think that's some good insights. Um, I think I, I really, I, I, I don't know how, like, I just, I really wonder if I wouldn't just be happier alone. Like maybe that's what I really want. And the only reason I want other people, okay, I would like to have a sounding board. You're absolutely right about that. When you say somebody you could just talk at in the guise of conversation, that does sound phenomenal. <laughs> um, and, and honestly, somebody to share life's triumphs and, and things like that with, right? And 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 that would be great to have. Um, but like, also it terrifies me the thought of having to, the rigidity. You're 100% right about the rigidity because it's like I have a set way of doing things. I have, a, And this is how I think of it. I have a set schedule of when I clean the house on Sundays, Sundays when I do laundry, Sundays, you know what I mean? And like I have a very rigid schedule. And I think a lot of that is 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 prison. You know what I mean? Sure. It's a rigid schedule in there. You eat when told to eat, what you're told to eat, and how you're told to eat it. And so you, you kind of you begin to find comfort in the routine. I began to find comfort in the routine. And I was literally the only thing I, that kept me going day to day is the routine. One meal to the next, one meal to the next, and then wake up, man, one meal to the next. And so I think that that's, that's um, yeah, I think that that rigidity, overcoming that rigidity and sharing my life and letting somebody into my intimate space would be difficult for me. Yeah, so baby steps, right? Mm. <laughs> So yeah, here's what I'd sure. say, Anthony, to sum you up, your problem is not one of learning what you want to do. It's about unlearning. Okay. So the second thing is you, you may be right that you may at the end of the day be happier alone, but you don't get to make that choice until you've tried. Try the alternative. That's fair. Yep. Cause that's so you gotta, giving up, isn't it? Uh, dude, you have to live fucking life. And living fair life enough, means uh, making mistakes to figure out what your life looks you. like. Thank you for that. Because I think that was just giving up saying that. I think that was just talking myself into giving up. So thank you, you. You may be right, but you don't get to make that decision yet. Until you've tested the alternative hypothesis. Yep. Right. And it's turned out to be a train wreck after train wreck after train wreck. If you want to grow up to be an adult, you have to have a, you have to have a string of bad relationships in your teenage years and early 20s. It's part of okay. the process. Okay. You know? So I'd say, like, if you're not entirely ready yet, like, slow steps, you don't have to open up completely, but I'd rein in some of that stuff about, you know, trying to impress people and, like, you're a genuinely good dude. You don't have to fake it, you know? Mm -hmm. So just let, let that authentically show. Do you think that professional therapy would be advisable or not really? Absolutely. Is it necessary? Is it necessary? Do you know. sense something in there, me that, that is off? No. Granted, so, it's only been two hours. I know it's no, so, so hard, let me but. let me explain let me explain to you, Anthony. This is very important to understand. I, mm. I would strongly recommend professional therapy to you, not because something is broken, but because you're so cerebral and you would get so much out of it. Is a bunch within you broken? Yeah, man. It's like a hurricane went through your internal self. But that's not the reason I'm in, uh, recommending therapy. 
I'm recommending therapy because you are really good at having conversations. And boy, if someone devoted one hour a week to helping you understand yourself, you would learn so much. Mm. It's not about fixing something. It's about like, think about this for a second. You could spend one hour a week having someone reflect on your inner personal journey. Helping you discover who you are. What holds you back? How does all this programming get laid down? You know, what's, what's software and what's hardware? All of these questions, I think you can do in therapy. That's why you should do it. Because you'd love it. Not because you need it. Yeah. Will, will it help you practically? I think so. Like, especially with insecurity and emotional, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, but yeah. And I'd say, you know, in terms of resources and stuff, I don't know exactly what your financial situation is like, but, you know, if you're a student, um, oftentimes they have discounted or available resources depending on, you know, what, there, there are ways to get it. You can kind of Google search, you know, sure. community mental health center, and oftentimes they can help you in some way. They can even like help you get on insurance. If your financial situation is like below a certain level, like you can basically get insurance to get therapy. Um but I, I would absolutely recommend it. I think I'd be, I mean, if you find a decent therapist that fits well with you, I think, uh, you know, doesn't, I think the thing you got to be careful about is like some therapists may over pathologize you. So they may like think like, oh my God, like Anthony's like such a, oh, he's like such a poor traumatized little baby. And there may be a part of you that really wants that compassion because you deserve it. Right. And there's a part of you that it's going to piss you off. It would, yeah, yeah. It would, it would be very awkward, right? It would be very like pity is very uncomfortable for yep. me. As was compassion, actually, I, I don't know the difference between compassion and pity, to be honest with you, and so I don't feel the difference. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's very shameful for me to get compassion. Very shameful. Yeah. So here's the difference. So pity oftentimes comes at the cost of respect, right? So what you really need is a therapist who can recognize that you've had a bunch of shit happen to you but that you are not like a victim. Like you are a victim, but like uh, you've been, you, let me say, let me say it this way. You have been victimized, but you are not a victim. I don't feel like I'm talking to a victim. I feel like I'm talking to a survivor. And that degree of respect, I think is going to be very important to you. And you have to be patient with therapists because when they hear about your life, what they're going to see is a victim. And as you overcome your ego and your rigidity, you will allow yourself to become a victim too. And you will say, actually, it's okay for people to pity me. It doesn't mean that I'm a weak person. But that's, that's going to take time, my friend. And, you know, I want to thank you for this time, Dr. K. And, you know, one of the things I like about you, I, I, this, I don't know if I've heard this word before, but you don't overpathologize people. Um, I've watched a lot of your previous sessions. I really resonated with the gifted group and I hope you get to have a follow-up session with them. I thought that was an amazing session and I would love to see it again. Um, but as for, you don't just jump straight to, well, I see that you're suffering from bipolar, you know, you know, all these self diagnoses that people lay on themselves. I see you don't indulge in any of that. You say, let's be, let's have common sense. And here's some very practical, you know, easily applicable things that you can, that you can put into your life. And that's what I really like about your style. And that's why I wanted to come on here. So thank you so much for the experience. I really got a lot out of it. Um, I don't know if you ever want to talk again, you guys have my contact information. Sure. Um, but thank you again so much. Thank you to chat for the support. Um, you, you've been awesome. This has been a great experience. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, Anthony. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being authentic and to a certain degree vulnerable. I, I, I think, um, you know, I know that there's some mental protections in terms of not seeing us again, but I think what you're doing is awesome. I think that this is the story that you're sharing is one that not enough people share because the truth is that there are a lot of people out there who are like you and that, you know, ex-cons are not people that should be relegated to menial labor for the rest of their life. You know, many of them are talented and gifted and, and dormant. I'll, I'll toss that word out again. I think you're just, dude, you're just like, you're just waking up. Give yourself time, but you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. So thanks for coming on and, and good luck. Thanks, Dr. K. You have a great one. Um, just a, I can't teach meditation today because we're about 20 minutes over, but otherwise mm -hmm. um, I would highly recommend, I think you should get an access code if you don't have one already 
just because you're a, a guest of the stream, but I would definitely recommend the meditations in the Atman Pada of Dr. K's Guide to Mental Health. Um, so we'll, we'll send you that, but uh, I'm sorry I can't teach you meditation today just because we're we kind of ran over. Best of luck. Seriously, Anthony, like I'm rooting for you, man. Appreciate you. And I appreciate you guys. Yeah, take care. Thanks, you too. Bye now. Okay, chat. We're over time. GG. Ooh, that was interesting. Um, Anthony's fantastic, right? It's so interesting. So here are a couple of takeaways. I, I don't know if y'all, if I need to say this, but... So too often, our identities get dominated by particular events in our life, right? I am a failure versus I failed a test. I am a convicted felon versus I committed a, a felony and, you know, served a prison sentence. And so, um, <laughs> and sometimes LSD is amazing. Yeah. So I think, I think if we want to talk about LSD for a second, I think it just speaks to the, the potential therapeutic value of, of psychedelic substances, which are being studied. Just a reminder, I don't know if y'all know this, but like, you know, people will have bad outcomes from LSD too. People will like develop anxiety and panic attacks and PTSD and all kinds of stuff. So I don't recommend that people use it. Um, at least until it gets sort of kind of verified through clinical trials. We try to stay as evidence-based as we can in terms of our recommendations here. But we do also offer a lot of non-evidence-based recommendations, to be fair. So in terms of LSD, you know, I'd say be careful. But I, I think, you know, for all of y'all, the thing that really shocked me about Anthony is how relatable he is, right? Because when we think about these labels, right, someone who like, you know, committed murder at the age of 16, it sounds like, and went to prison for 20 some odd years. Like we don't think about someone who's so relatable. But I think part of why I love doing this work is because we're all human and the experiences that we share are like surprisingly similar. And so a lot of the stuff that he's dealing with, I think is very common in our community about this whole business of friend zone and being insecure and like doing things for people and then feeling resentful because you've invested so much and they haven't given you anything. Because you were, and then you feel that entitlement and then you start to feel like, constantly rejected and, and it kind of changes the way that you think. So be super careful about your rigid thinking. I think part of what holds us back in general is our very rigid thinking. And Anthony's a smart guy. So clearly he's like super high IQ is capable of a lot. Um, and, and, you know, he's just the, another key kind of takeaway is that a lot of what holds us back, a lot of like growing and learning is not so much as actually not about learning. It's about unlearning that usually what human beings do is we'll develop adaptations to our circumstances. And those help us survive particular periods. And then growing as a person involves letting go of those adaptations and actually trying something different. It's letting go of the strategy that works. You know, if I kind of think about a video game analogy, it's sort of like you can get away with something in like low level games, right? You can be like a one trick pony and like Zerg rush your opponents, like six pool people people even know what that means. You know, you can do like some kind of cheese strat when you're in bronze league. But as you ascend through the ranks, like you can't keep using that cheese strat over and over and over again. You actually have to unlearn things and start to come up with different strategies as you rise through the ranks. And so if you feel stuck, like I'm concerned that if Anthony doesn't unlearn what he's had to uh, uh, learn to survive, he will stay stuck, right? Another six years will go by, he won't be in a relationship. And so if y'all are feeling stuck in life, it's not so much that you're, you know, bad at something or you're a failure or you're lazy or you're dis undisciplined. That's all unactionable information. So let go of that crap. Instead, what you need to be asking yourself is like, how did I learn to do the things that I do? You know, when did I, how did I benefit from playing video games 24 seven? And you may say to yourself, oh, I didn't benefit at all. It's all a waste. That's when your, your thinking needs to be better. You need to be a little bit more clinical, a little bit more scientific. Recognize that playing video games all day long protects you from all kinds of stuff. You don't have to feel shame while you're playing a game. When you have a 60 minute game of Dota and you come back at the last second against Meta, Mega Creeps, you get to feel like the best thing on earth. And what else in your life gives you that feeling? What else in your life gives you a feeling of absolute triumph and dominance, right? When you don't have access to those feelings in the rest of your life, that's why you play the game. It does things for you that you aren't able to do in your regular life. 
So you may think that all of the things that hold you back are negatives. What you need to understand is that all of those things are actually positives. They're not problems, they're solutions. And moving forward actually is about undoing solutions that have gotten us to where we are.